was Dancing in the Street, which he sang with Mick Jagger, and in the first part of an exclusive interview with Paul Gambaccini, Bowie explains why his performance at Live Aid was one of the highlights of his long career. Emotionally, I think it was probably one of the highlights of anything that I've done. I mean, the emotional punch that that carried for all of the artists that were working on that was just um, irreplaceable. I don't think we'll see the likes of that again. It was, uh, it was uh, sensational coming together. It's something that I'm sure Bob had no idea would take on the proportions that it did take on and carry the, uh, uh, carry the weight of, of responsibility that it that carried at the time and forever will as a landmark of what popular music can achieve. I recall Even be as symbolic as it was, because no amount of those kind of fundraisers will ever eradicate a problem. That's a governmental decision and a governmental directive. They have to get behind those things. But a ball can be started rolling by something like that. And I think, uh, it, I think Bob uh, did an extraordinary job on that. It was just incredible. The only uh, neg negative factor that one can see in those kinds of concerts, that it's like, um, it's like saying the same thing too many times. It, it doesn't, it, it's not received anymore. You know, I wonder if that happens. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe I'm very wrong about that. You mentioned uh, Iggy Pop. What was the uh, appeal of him that made you work with him on his own album and then return to work with him? Um, when we first met, I think we kind of hit it. Oh, we met in, I think it was about 71 or 72, uh, in Max's Kansas City. And uh, it was uh, Lou Reed, myself, and Iggy. Uh, at one table, sitting there, not <laughs> and hadn't have a word to say to each other. I don't think Iggy and uh, Lou had ever met before either, so it was very uncomfortable feeling. The three of us sort of sitting there, um, sort of balancing our egos against each other and wondering who should say what. It was a inauspicious occasion to say the least. But within a week or so of that, I got to know both of them very well separately. They were much easier to deal with when it's just a one-on-one -on -one thing, and uh, Iggy particularly became a very good mate of mine. Um, I'd always admired him uh, because we're so unlike each other, radically unlike each other. And that's probably, I think I've always felt that's the, usually the, the basis of uh, an excellent friendship. I remember seeing him live and being afraid that he was actually going to bare-chested jump on broken glass. I mean, that was his image, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, I think, probably positive and negative for him. I mean, it, 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 one, it held him, one, it held back the fact that he was probably one of the better songwriters in America. I mean, it, it was very hard for people to see past the, oh, he's is going to cut himself up again routine, you know. Um, but there again, he did do that at once. Uh, and that, that really, that, <laughs> that really hurt him. I'm <laughs> sorry. That's silly. Uh, <laughs> It, it really got in the way of him developing as an artist. 1983, nice to see that. With the rock star, he tells Paul Gambaccini some of the unusual ways he's performed Space Oddity. I can tell you they are unusual, and how they didn't sometimes go according to plan. Oddity was a number which you've presented on stage in many ways. Yeah. Uh, one that I particularly recall was during your Diamond Dogs tour when you were suspended over the audience by Crane. Do you remember yes, I remember it very well. We, well, the idea was, it, um, the Diamond Dog Tour consisted of a series of buildings spaced somewhat on the, uh, uh, the buildings in uh, the Fritz Lang movie, Metropolis, and sort of gaping mouths for windows. It sort of had that dark, ominous look. And uh, the guy who was doing Space Oddity was uh, occupied in a, a typist or secretary's egg chair, one of those great white egg chairs that were sort of fashionable in the 60s. And he sat in that, in the top window of the building, it was me, uh, with a telephone. And at some point during the song, it, as it was on a cherry picker, the entire chair came out of the window and hovered over the uh, audience, about, about eight rows out. Uh, which is okay, but when those things go wrong, and you get to the end of the song, and you're just stuck out there, and it won't go back again. And you end up doing two or three songs out there until they can get the machinery working to get it back in again. It was horrible. Ground control. Can you think of how you're going to present Space Oddity this time? Uh, <clears throat> this time around, uh, I think this is probably uh, one of the more simple shows that, that I've... Uh, it's, what, 
What we're trying to do is uh, we're working with a new system of interactive video, which should, I think, might be quite startling if, if it's... We see the effects of it next week that we're going into um, experimental uh, stage with it to see how our ideas came off. Um, that's, re that's the only theatric side of what we're doing, I think. It's probably the most simple tour I've done since probably stage in the If you are, in fact, saying goodbye to these greatest hits, mm. might you be saying goodbye to the greatest hits audience? And will yes. you miss a crowd that big? No. Uh, yes. Yes to the first question, no to the second. You do feel more comfortable playing to a smaller crowd? I feel a lot more comfortable with certain kinds of work. Yeah. There's also a, a kind of a euphoric quality, which I'm sure I'm going to miss as well. Um, when a lot of people are all singing a song that one wrote, I mean, that is just an absolute... It's a fantastic sensation to do a cha 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 changes and, like, all these voices are coming back at you. That's, uh, that's, that's extraordinary. I'm sure I'll miss that. All right. He said, look at the deal. Oh, <laughs> More day goodbye tomorrow. Today's top story, the budget, well, it's met with a mixed reception today. It's pleased Conservatives failed to ease city fears about the economy, and Labour say it's just not enough to solve Britain's economic problems. Lindy. Time now is uh, about eight and a half minutes to eight, if you're keeping an eye on the clock. And that means it's time to continue with our fascinating series of interviews with superstar David Bowie. Now, Bowie is one of those artists who's always looking for new and unusual ways of delivering his music to his thousands of adoring fans. So for his latest world tour, which started its British leg this week, the rock superstar has installed a special telephone which will allow fans to ring in and vote for the songs that they want him to perform. Amazing. And in the third part of our exclusive interview with him, he tells Paul Gambaccini why he's decided to go on a world tour performing only his greatest hits. I think it's one of the things that I probably do best is uh, stage performances. Um, and I enjoy the challenge of it to a certain degree. Sometimes it gets quite arduous. This particular tour, I think, came about mainly because uh, an American company called Ryko Disc um, had prepared and researched and found an awful lot of my very old and obscure and unreleased material and started putting it out in the United States. And in collaboration with EMI over here, they're doing much the same thing. And one of the things they intended to do uh, in the middle of this year was to put out a, an album of my best known songs. And I, I really didn't want to be trapped within the uh, prospects of having to go back out on tour every year or every couple of years for the rest. Songs that were getting older and older and songs that at, at some point it, you feel it's hard to interpret them any more new ways, you know, they become sort of almost redundant. Um, so I thought it might be good to do these particular songs, which will be the best known songs that I've done. Probably, for, uh, well, it will be definitely for the last time. It is very difficult to say never. Uh, I remember Mick Jagger saying he didn't want to perform Satisfaction in his middle age. Elton John saying he didn't want to do Crocodile Rock after he was 30. Both had Yes, to I've heard that too. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know how they feel about that. And one always feels drawn, oh, well, I could always do that again, Satisfaction or Crocodile Rock. Well, not me. <laughs> um, and uh, I just thought that it might be worth really, really trying for it to not do them ever again. I've done these songs to whatever I go on the road with again will have to be something that I have the utmost belief in, uh, which is a great way to start again for, for me, for the 90s, for my age. You know, it's this peculiar crossroads in rock now where there's so many of us approaching 40s and will shortly be in their 50s. Um, so it's, this is kind of a, a brave new world for us. So the, the, the possibilities are almost limitless. What can we do now? Do we do what is the usual predictable thing, which is an artist carries his reper repertoire with him throughout his career? But as we were doing new things when we first started, we should also continue to do new things now. So I thought this might be something to try. Also thought it was a good idea to, for me to, um, make a new start with what I'm trying to do as a, uh, an artist, which is work with this band called Tin Machine that I'm working with. Is this a case of I have seen the future of David Bowie and its name is Tin Machine? <laughs> Not really, no, because I'm also working on a solo project for next year. Um, but we went back into the studio as Tin Machine just before I started rehearsals for this tour, and uh, we completed an album there in, that I, I'm over the moon about. I think it's wonderful. 
and it's, it's, it's somewhat different in tone in as much that taking those guys out of the California environment and putting them in, in Sydney, a place none of them had ever been to before, made them all go into themselves. And, and it, the whole thing became, again, sort of stuff from the interior, but quiet and reflective, but still with these very aggressive kind of guitars. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd, pleasing com uh, combination. <laughs> Ooh, time to catch your breath. David Bowie and friends there. Welcome back. Today's top story. The Home Secretary, David Waddington, has ordered another inquiry into the case of the Birmingham bombers. The action could result in the case being referred to the Court of Appeal again. Time now is just about ten to eight. Now, speculative press stories about their private lives are something that most public figures have to live with. And when you're as big a rock star as David Bowie, they seem to be quite relentless. Well, in the fourth part of our, our exclusive interview with Bowie, he explains to Paul Gambaccini why he doesn't get offended by the media prying into his private life. It's understandable the press have one priority, and that's to uh, increase the circulation of their newspapers. And Obviously, me talking about the um, songs on Tim Machine is not very exciting stuff. Um, that's <laughs> that's the, the, the shortest answer I can give. I mean, their emphasis is always going to be on the, the marriage, the money, and the man, you know. <laughs> Do you think it is reasonable, uh, perhaps understandable, it's that it should be that way? That it, it's understandable, of course. It's the media that we've created. I mean, we have this network of media communication so competitive, so vast. Uh, they have to go to extraordinary measures to keep their own heads above water, and they certainly do. I suppose also perhaps you asked for it in that classic statement by going on record with your alleged public life early in your career. Now oh, perhaps very much so, yeah. yeah. Now they may expect you to continue to do so. Um, yes, I think it probably comes as a disappointment when I'm not so eager to break rules these days. You know. uh, Maybe it doesn't, maybe some are relieved. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I've always been uh, of the opinion that, like anything else, there are two ways of doing anything. And one, to walk down the street one way, you can be recognized, and walk down it another way. You needn't. I think it depends how much you want to be recognized. You can, I mean, you can hire helicopters to fly over the church and make sure that there's video going so that you can say, stop taking pictures. You know, that looks, that's all sort of a, you know, it's a very kind of California thing, you know. Um, or you can just discreetly disappear somewhere and get married. Do you know what option you'll take? Oh, here? yes, of course I do. <laughs> is it the kind of thing you'll announce in advance? Or no, let it happen? no way. <laughs> right. You think you'll just let it happen? Ah, oh, well, it's happened five times, as you know. Right, right. Uh, this really is your biggest worldwide pop hit. It's been yes. number one in uh, so many countries. Yeah. And also, it was one of the songs used to try to get General Noriega to leave the Vatican Embassy. Were you aware of that? I, I read about that when I got to America. Yes, I, that was <laughs> that was extraordinary. Yeah, they blasted him with that and China Girl and some Hendrix and and what else? Oh, there's I fought the law. That I said I fought the law. And the law won. I thought that the Let's Dance choice was quite peculiar, but I'm, um, that's an interesting prospect. Fascinating to hear. I wonder a if it might helped him make a decision. Now let's dance. Uh, was such a w wonderful pop record. Can you yourself see that album as the peak of your commercial career? Well, in terms of uh, uh, how it's commercially received, of course it was. Uh, it's uh, frankly, I mean, it, it, the, the, the song itself, Let's Dance, didn't start out to be anything more than just another song on the album. It was Niall Rogers, the, the co-producer with me on that album that took it and structured it in such a way that it had that incredible commercial appeal. I really, I, I was just in a, a state of shock, disbelief, when it started rocketing up, up the charts like it did. I mean, it was, it was astounding. It really was. And for me, it was, a, it was a strange position to be in, because up until that point, I'd been probably... I was a cult artist, actually, in, more, in, in very much in those terms. I had an audience. It was a very large audience, but it was a cult audience. I, I was, hadn't really been considered sort of uh, uh, a popular art. About five to eight. Now, if you've been watching all this week, you know that around about this time, we've been featuring our exclusive interview with David Bowie. And in this particular episode, David will be telling Paul Gambaccini the lessons that he's learned after years at the top. Well, in the old days, somebody else used to own everything used to I mean a writer uh, a songwriter an artist didn't own anything that he did I mean it's, it hit a lot of us artists in the early days 
You know, that's not known really anymore. I mean, uh, songwriters generally keep uh, possession of that which they create. You know. And now but then it was very hard because, you know, it was almost, well, please record me. And they say, yeah, well, give me everything and then we'll record you. It was that sort of approach. And now the credit know. on Tin Machine, for example, says, made by David Bowie, at least to EMI, for example. This one, in fact, says, made by Tin Machine. <laughs> right, right. Now, I have to observe that you were the solo artist yeah. most in demand to have your work released on compact disc, who had not yet had it done so. The Beach yeah. Boys were the group most yeah. in demand. Why was there that delay? Um, the delay would have been because uh, up until when I'd... Uh, you see, what you do, you lease tapes to companies, and then there's this, they have them for a certain period, and then they return back to the artist again. And I'd had mine returned a few years ago, and frankly, I didn't know of anybody who would do the kind of justice that I wanted done to my early work until Ryko Disc made the approach, and they are a sensational company. And they're, they're, they win all the awards as an independent label for the care that they take in the digital remastering and the research that they do and the packaging, everything about... They really care about the stuff that they're working with. With that song, I established very much the way I felt about fame at that time. I think, you know, one changes one's opinion. M m I change uh, my mind like I change hats. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I fluctuate between one opinion and another continually. But at that particular time, I was uh, very embittered about uh, having felt that I'd been ripped off and uh, having felt depressed with my own personal situation and that kind of thing. So that's the elements that went into producing that song. Time allows you the power to have control of your own career. Does it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you can uh, produce a semblance of a, 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 a feet, uh, feet on the earth kind of attitude after a time. I don't know, you know, it's, it, it's, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, the future can tell. What you need, you have to borrow. In terms of your own musical taste, uh, it is as non-chart oriented as the artists you have described are in terms of mass appeal. When yes, asked it to, is. When asked to list your ten favorite albums of the decade by The Telegraph, you came up with artists, most of whom the, the public would not recognize. Two of them were your own, which I thought was interesting. And at the press conference, you mentioned Alien Sex Fiend. Yeah. Do you still listen to new releases? I do. I, I, um, it, I, do, I do listen to uh, new bands. Generally, uh, people introduce me to them. I find that I don't sort of... I don't, I don't ferret around as much as I used to in bands to listen to or interesting artists. Um, I think there are some artists that I naturally buy because I've always been admirers of their work, and so I, 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 I tend to buy whatever their new releases are. Philip Glass, I've always been a huge fan of. Um, Steve Reich, I like quite as much. And uh, Glenn Branca, I think those are three that I... If there's a new release, I tend to buy it, you know. But it's, um, it's surprising how many uh, fans actually uh, just send me the artists they're listening to. By the way, have you ever heard of this band or this guy, you know? And they say... David Bowie talking there to Paul Gambaccini. Quick look at the weather now. Southern Britain